Hello. My name is Donovan Ripkema, and I'm principal of a small firm called Place Economics. Uh, and we're a small firm, but with a very narrow focus, is that everything we do is at the intersection of historic preservation and economics. And it was in that context that we were fortunate enough to do a study in Colombia on the uh, impacts of historic preservation in your city. So I want to share with you what we learned. And the study itself had five components. Uh, that we looked at the demographics in historic districts, who lives there. We looked at the role of older housing, whether or not it was designated historic in terms of providing affordable housing in Colombia. We looked at the impact of local historic designation on property values. We looked at the impact of the Bailey Bill. The Bailey Bill is a great incentive program to encourage investment in historic structures. And we looked at the uh, historic uh, the heritage tourism industry in Colombia. But before we get into the, the particular findings of those five areas, I want to start with really the basics, and that is what historic districts are in Colombia. Well, in fact, there's four kinds. There's architectural conservation districts. There are what are called protection areas. There's a landmark district, very similar in structure to the architectural conservation districts. There's the uh, historic commercial district, and then there are the rest of the city. Uh, in the city as a whole, a little less than 4% of the land area of the city as a whole is within these local historic districts. Then we looked at how the population changed. Well, Columbia is a growing city. And in the, in the first uh, 10 years of the 21st century, the rest of the city grew about 8%, while both of the categories of local historic districts, the architectural conservation district and the protection areas, in fact, declined in numbers of people living there. In the second 10 years of the 21st century, the architectural conservation district still declined a bit. Uh, the, the protection areas grew a bit, but again, at a rate less than uh, the rest of the city. Now, the issue of population density, and it's a very important one. Uh, transportation planners, city planners, uh, land use people, public safety people will all explain that it's really important to have density in a city uh, for effective and efficient delivery of public services. Well, what we found was that both the architecture conservation districts and the protection areas have a population density that is per, pe per person uh, per square mile, people per square mile, greater than, significantly greater than the rest of the residentially zoned area in Colombia. Uh, and what this demonstrates is, in fact, you can have density in a city at a human scale, as opposed to density simply by 40-story condominiums. Then we looked at the demographics in the historic districts. So uh, if about a uh, little less than 4% of the land area uh, within Colombia is within historic districts, about 6.5% of the population lives in the architectural conservation districts or in the protection areas. 93.5% of the population is not within an historic district. Now, what might be a surprise to some, sometimes historic districts are seen as, well, that they're, they're fine, but that's where the rich people live. In fact, in both the architectural conservation districts and the protection areas, a greater share of the population in those areas, in fact, fall at the bottom of the household income spectrum, greater than in the rest of Colombia. At the upper end, in the architectural conservation uh, districts, a, a greater share uh, of the households have, are at the upper end of the uh, income spectrum. But we, have, we call that economic integration. And we think that's healthy at a neighborhood level, that in fact, you have people with very modest incomes living right next door to people with significant incomes. And again, in both the conservation districts and the protection areas, that is the case. The racial distribution, however, is a, a, a bit skewed. That in the city of Columbia, just short of half of the population is white. About 40% is black and the balance is Asian and other. Uh, but a larger share of the populations, both in the architectural conservation districts and in the protection areas, are in fact white than is true in the city as a whole. 
It's a different story, however, with the distribution between owners and renters in that there is a slightly larger share of the populations who are homeowners in both the protection areas and the architectural conservation districts than in the city as a whole. Uh, of some concern, uh, frankly, is the change in minority population in the historic districts. I mentioned earlier that there is a, a greater share of white population in those historic districts. Uh, but the minority population, in fact, has declined uh, over the last decade uh, in both the architectural conservation districts and the protection areas, as opposed to a growth in the minority population in the city as a whole. Then the issue about older housing and affordability. Again, housing affordability is reaching crisis stage in many cities across the country. And so the question here was, what is the role of older housing stock, whether or not it's deemed historic, just older housing stock, what does that contribute uh, to the affordability picture? And, and for this approach, we looked at census blocks that had a more than half of the housing stock was built more than 50 years ago, more built prior to 1970. Again, just being old doesn't make it historic. Um, but we just, but we, we didn't worry about whether it's designated historic or not, or even if it should be designated, just simply are these neighborhoods that have a concentration of older housing stock? Well, what we learned was about uh, 40, uh, 5% of all the housing units in Colombia, in fact, are in these pre-1970 uh, neighborhoods. And you can see where they are kind of in the core, the central part of, uh, of Colombia. But what are the differences uh, in, those, uh, in those areas in terms of incomes? And what you see is that in both the, the households that have uh, an income of less than 30% of the area median income, and those between 30 and 80% of the area median income, that is at the lower end of the economic spectrum, a larger share of those live in these older housing areas than live in the city as a whole. When you get to the upper ends of the income spectrum, more of them live in the newer uh, uh, housing neighborhoods. Uh, and here, unlike the historic districts, here there's a real strong balance, uh, racial balance of those older neighborhoods. Uh, in the pre-1970 block groups, about 53% um, of the population is white, but about 39% is black. About the same, uh, slightly greater share of the black population lives in these older neighborhoods uh, than lives in the uh, post-1970 black group. So here there's a real uh, racial balance in the older and the newer neighborhoods. Uh, on, the, on the owner and rental side of things, however, there's a higher, a measurably higher share of homeowners in those pre-1970 block groups, meaning that it provides affordability uh, for people to become homeowners, a greater share in older neighborhoods uh, than in newer ones. Now, we also looked at just not the incomes, but the change in incomes and the change in housing costs for both renters and owners uh, over the last 10 years in Colombia. Uh, what we found is that uh, among rental um, about rental households, the increase in gross rent was greater than the change in the income of those renter groups, meaning this housing affordability uh, equation, particularly for renters, is getting worse, not better over the last decade. The kind of reverse situation was true of homeowners. While there's been about a 20% increase in the average home value, there's been about a 27% increase in the median income of household owners uh, in, the, in that last 10 year period. Then we looked at the impact of local designation, being in a local historic district on property values. And this is a, often an area of concern particularly when a new historic district is, is being discussed because people say, well, yeah, but if we're an historic district, there's another layer of regulation. We're going to have to get approval for major changes from a, from the uh, commission. And that extra layer of, of review is going to hurt my property values. Well, in fact, that's not the case. 
uh, in the architectural, the raw values. Uh, we can look from uh, 2014 to compared to 2022. Uh, the average values were the greatest in uh, in both cases uh, in the architectural conservation districts. Uh, the protection areas, however, in fact, were more affordable. That is lower values uh, than in the rest of the residentially zoned uh, properties in um, in Colombia. But more important than the values themselves was the change in value. For the vast majority of American households, the, our major asset is our home. And if there's ever going to be any generational uh, uh, transfer of wealth, for a vast majority of it, that's going to become through the value of our home. Well, what we can see that over the last decade is, in fact, both the architectural conservation districts and the protection areas had a rate of value increase greater than the rest of the residential property. So those uh, households that choose to be in historic districts, in fact, are building wealth in those houses at a rate greater than uh, the rest of the community. Then we looked at here to tourism. And I guess at least to us as outsiders, we didn't particularly think about uh, Columbia, South Carolina being a magnet for heritage visitors, but we were wrong. In fact, it's decidedly so. We were fortunate as a research side is that the state of South Carolina had just completed commissioning one of the excellent uh, research firms in the world on heritage, on, on tourism, a Longwoods group to do a statewide analysis of tourism. We were able to buy from the Longwood uh, organization the Columbia-specific information, and we resorted their data so we could look at uh, the heritage visitors. So heritage visitors are about 25% of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, the, of uh, overnight visitors. 25% of overnight visitors, uh, of all visitors were overnight visitors, but about 39% of the uh of the overnight visitors were in fact heritage visitors. Here's why that's important. That is a general rule that 60 to 70 percent of a visitor's expenditures will be made in wherever they stay overnight. So while we love visitors of all kinds, it's those visitors that stay overnight that have a much larger economic impact. Well, among uh, heritage visitors, about 47% of them were overnight visitors, as opposed to slightly less than a third of non-heritage visitors who stayed overnight in Colombia. And this manifests itself in terms of their expenditures. So the expenditures about $15, $14 a day greater for every heritage visitor than for non-heritage visitors. This share of heritage visitation has a major impact on the economy in Colombia. When you're a tourist, you basically spend all of your money in five areas. You spend it on where you stay overnight. You spend it on local transportation, on the rental car, on gas for your own car, on the bus, on the rental car company. You spend it on food and beverage. You spend it on retail purchases. And you spend it in the category called amusements and entertainment. And that's kind of the miscellaneous. If you go to a, a concert, you go to the movies, you pay entrance to a, to a museum. That's this other category. Well, just the heritage portion of the visitor industry in Colombia generates 5,800 direct jobs uh, in Colombia. So that's local people getting a job directly because of the heritage visitors uh, to Colombia and another um, you know, 1,500 uh, uh, indirect and induced jobs. And those jobs have paychecks. The heritage portion of tourism in Colombia means that there's $181 million worth of income to workers in those uh, five areas. The direct jobs created by the heritage visitors. But businesses, hotels, and restaurants, and retail shops are not the only beneficiaries. Another major beneficiary of the heritage visitors uh, are uh, state and local governments uh, who receive $37 million in tax revenues from the heritage portion of the tourist, tourist industry in Colombia. And then there's the Bailey Bill. Again, we won't spend a lot of time talking about exactly how the Bailey Bill works, but basically it's this. 
It encourages investment in historic buildings. And if you in make that investment, then you get a, a freeze on the assessment level of your property for 20 years uh, in Colombia. So it's an encouragement for people to invest. And unlike the federal tax credit for historic properties, which only applies to commercial properties. The Bailey Bill is usable both for uh, commercial properties, but also for residential properties. So you can use that for your own home. In fact, that's what hundreds of people did. The, the historic preservation projects that get the major headlines are the multi-million dollar uh, commercial developments. And of course, they're wonderful. But in fact, most of the projects, over half of the projects that used the Bailey Bill were less than $100,000. Over a third of them, in fact, were less than $50,000. So this really is a kind of mom and pop uh, incentive, very effective. Uh, and where those projects took place? Well, a little over half took place in the architectural conservation districts, a little less than 20% in the protection areas, uh, and a little less than 30% uh, elsewhere. Uh, elsewhere is uh, in National Register historic districts that are not also local district uh, and in uh, individual landmark buildings. Now, in terms of projects by number, about half of them were residential projects, a little over 40% were commercial properties, uh, and 8% kind of mixed use. That's in terms of numbers of projects. But investment, about three quarters of the investment for these Bailey Bill projects took place in those uh, commercial projects. Now, one of the requirements to get the incentive is you have to spend a certain share of the assessed value of the property. Uh, and when we looked at all of the Bailey Bill projects that have done that requirement, those projects had to, the, the threshold was about $15 million um, that you had to spend. But in fact, 15 times that much uh, was spent uh, by the investors in these historic properties. $217 million was the actual investment that took place. What this means is it really is a catalytic program that people are spending much more than they have to spend uh, being catalyzed by that assessment freeze over time. So the, the Bailey Bill, the expenditures kind of goes up and down with the local economy and with the real estate market. But when you average that out over time, almost 58 direct jobs every year are created simply from those Bailey Bill projects, representing $3 million in the pocket through paychecks of local Columbia citizens. So it's like a great small business has been attracted uh, to Columbia, the activity in the Bailey Bill. Because this is foregoing tax revenues, there's legitimate concern on the part of the city council and the county commission saying, hey, we're foregoing tax revenues by giving this incentive. Are we costing the taxpayers money? Are we costing revenue uh, in the public coffers that we could spend on other things by providing this incentive? There is a, a, an approach to looking at incentives called the but for analysis, and it asks the question, would this project take you have taken place but for the incentive now if you used if you did a survey of everybody who used the incentive probably nearly all of them said oh yeah i'd never done this project were it not for that incentive well some of them would have taken place anyway so the question so what we did is create a model that says what share of those projects would not have taken place were it not for the bailey bill and what is the consequences of that uh, to the city and county revenues? So we, we, we did the whole spectrum. If 100% of them would have taken place, even if there were no Bailey bill, or 100% of them would none of, basically none of them would have taken place were it not for the Bailey bill. Now, both extremes are impossible. That some of them would have taken place without them. It's also true that, that it, it's unlikely that none of them would have taken place without it. So we just made a, uh, a recording, and the kind of magic number uh, is about uh, 27%. That is to say, if at least 27% of the projects – 
would not have taken place were it not for the Bailey Bill. Over a 30-year period, both the city and the county generate more dollars, more dollars as tax revenues than had there been no incentive at all. So, in fact, on any reasonable grounds, and this chart is a, assumes a million dollars worth of investment. In fact, on, on commercial properties, the, the life, the 30-year revenues into the city is uh, into the city and the county is $100,000 more because there were um, uh, tax credits than if there were not. That's if all of them worked only because of the Bailey Bill. If uh, uh, half of them only took place because of the Bailey Bill, uh, the, the, uh, the city and the county are $32,000 better off on the, res on the commercial properties, $21,000 better off on the residential properties. To summarize, if at least 27% of these projects would not have taken place, were it not for the Bailey Bill. In fact, the taxpayers of, uh, of the city and the county are better off there having given the incentive than had there been no incentive at all. So it is very much a an investment of tax dollars to get a greater return over the 30-year period. So that's what we learned in, in Colombia. Uh, the summary is that this is a an approach, a part of the economy that does a great benefit to the taxpayers, to the citizens, to the property owners, to the renters uh, in the city of Columbia. Congratulations on having an excellent preservation program. Thank you very much for listening.